domain 2.5 is going to be going over mitigation techniques that we can use to secure our enterprise. So the objectives we're going to go over are different segment segmentation technologies, access control, and then just different ways we can have overall better security. We're also going to go over configuration enforcement, decommissioning of data or physical devices, and then get in more specifically into our different hardening techniques. Okay, so segmentation. So this involves dividing a network into smaller parts to control the flow and access and also enhancing security and performance. So there's a couple different ways we can perform segmentation. We can have a physical segmentation, which would be something like an air gap, where actual devices, when I mean devices, I could mean a switch, I could mean an entire network, is physically separated. There is no connection between them. Or we can have logical segmentation like we have here using something like VLANs. VLANs allow the logical segmentation by adding a four byte header onto the layer two field or to the layer two header that's going to segment traffic locally on one single device and then also going to separate devices into separate subnets and broadcast domains. So within the LAN, we can separate broadcast domains and set and subnets within their own segments using things like VLANs. With an air gap, imagine you have two enterprises. Let's say you work in manufacturing. So not let's say you have an enterprise and you have SCADA and ICS systems. So you have your enterprise over here, and that's going to contain or your typical enterprise endpoints, users, services, and servers, right? Maybe you have like exchange, domain controllers, file surfaces, and that's where your users go on and do their day-to-day -day work. And then you have your SCADA system here. The reason you want to air gap these systems is because you don't want a potential vulnerability from the enterprise affecting your critical infrastructure over here in your SCADA or ICS system, your industrial uh, control systems, right? You also see this at a more like smaller level. If you have a building you want to secure, you will have your regular enterprise. And then you also have a whole separate CCTV network that never touches that enterprise, okay? Access control. So access control ensures that only authorized users or systems can view, modify, or utilize resources in a computing environment. So we can do things like have access control list, and just at a high level, we can do least privilege, access control list, and set different permissions, and have also user accountability with access control by doing things like tracking and logging access that uh, we can get with even like AAA protocols, right? Like TACX, Radius. So the good thing about access control, technically and at the logical level, it can be adjusted based on context. It has that dynamic control. So if a user, let's say in the sales department, needs to get access to the accounting department's file share, for whatever reason, we can dynamically adjust that either on their Active Directory user object, um, or maybe we don't have an actual domain like that. We can just do it on a local base basis. So an access control list. So ACLs are a set of rules that control network traffic. So typically you're going to see ACLs applied anywhere where we have separate zones. And what I mean by that is if we check out this network here, right here is probably going to be our enterprise network. That's going to be our inside or internal zone. Right here is the customer edge device. That's the device that's going to connect us to the internet. And that's the untrusted network or the untrusted zone. At that router, like if we don't have a dedicated firewall, we can create ACLs to permit and filter traffic into our internal device and leaving externally. ACLs are not just limited to routers, though, guys. They can be on uh, multi-layer switches. You could have VLAN access control lists, so layer two switch uh, access control lists. And then also firewalls, that's really all they are. At a base level, if you're not talking next generation firewalls or uh, any firewall that has additional features, just a basic layer three, layer four filtering device that's dedicated to that, it's just a bunch of ACLs with permit and deny statements, okay? So this is how we can have security enhancement 
when we have a simple network like this. Permissions. So we can set permissions on users or systems. So we can have a couple different access control schemes or methods on how we set our permissions, okay? So first off, we wanna talk about mandatory access control, discretionary access control, and role-based access control. Mandatory access control is based off a of need to know. Discretionary is when the owner of that object sets read, write, and execute permissions. And then our back is role-based access control. This is where depending on the user's role, that's gonna how that's gonna be how we determine what permissions are gonna be set. With permissions, you always want to think about and enforce the concept of least privilege. Okay. So it doesn't matter what access control scheme we go with, whether we're in an active directory environment or we're setting permissions locally on a Windows machine or even on our Linux devices, we always want to enforce the concept of least privilege. You can see here on our Linux device, we can check out permissions where to this project2.txt file, the owner is going to be student5, and we have his permissions over here. So we have read, write, read, write, and then no permissions, okay? So that's how we set things on Active Directory. I mean, excuse me, on Linux devices. Linux device, that is definitely Linux. It says Ubuntu right there. And then we have different application lists. So let's go over an application allow list. So an application allow list and uh, application allow listing involves specifying a list of approved ap applications that are permitted to run on a system while having what's called the implicit deny at the end. So what this allows us to do is to say, okay, look, we have to statically set on whatever system that may be, whether it's a host-based uh, firewall whether that's at the network level, if we have a next generation firewall that we're doing our allow list, we're going to have an implicit deny at the end, and we're going to have to go through and allow certain applications. Now, when you build the allow list, so <laughs> sometimes this isn't very granular in your approach, and sometimes it is. So let's break that down. So some allow list, you're going to filter based off recognized hashes. So what do we mean by that? The Microsoft Corporation, it has a bunch of different software under its umbrella, right? Like Office 365, among other, a bunch of different applications we don't need to list. We can have an allow list that says, hey, if it matches this Microsoft hash or signature, right? Allow it in. So that means anything Microsoft's gonna be allowed. Well, what if we want things more granular? We can do that with certain devices, whitelist or allow list, where we can say, we don't just wanna take a signature of a corporation that puts out software, we wanna be very granular. Are we allowing Word, Excel, 365, Teams? Are we actually allowing these specific applications? This can be very granular, where you can say, we want to allow Facebook Messenger, but we wanna deny Facebook. So we can even do something like this because Messenger could potentially be its own application. So when we look at like Facebook.com and we open up, I'm opening this up to the side here, our messages. So I can look at my business one, right? That brings us to a different subdomain here. But if we just go to Facebook.com, That's just facebook.com. So we could be very granular in how we actually approach uh, controlling applications. Okay, then isolation. So isolation in cybersecurity refers to the practice of separating resources or processes to prevent them from affecting each other. So this is like a, just a way we can do containment. When we do incident response, this is where we determine how we are gonna contain. Are we gonna isolate? Are we just gonna do segmentation? Are we just gonna harden maybe some ports on that device to allow, to stop whatever worm uh, from propagating throughout the network? With isolation, this ensures that if one system or application is compromised, that the threat does not spread to others, okay? So this would be like shutting down that port, 
or maybe even putting that interface into what's called a private VLAN where it can't access any of the other network resources and can't affect any of the other devices on separate VLANs. Patching. So when we're talking about mitigation techniques we can use to secure the enterprise, we always want to have good patch management. How we apply patches is always going to depend on the situation. So as an organization, like I've talked about previously in the course, you don't always want to just apply a patch right away. There's going to be a lot of different variables that come into play here. One, is it an emergency patch? Is it an emergency? What we mean by that is, is something failing on our device unless we do this patch? Or do we have a CVSS score of 10 for a common vulnerability and exploit, right? If that's the case, yes, an emergency patch. If this is just regular updates, regular updates, and we are using a lot of third-party applications that could be affected by that patch, what do we want to do? We want to sandbox it, do some tests on this patching, develop a back-out and roll-out plan, execute that patch in a sandbox environment that mimics our production and development, or excuse me, our production environment, make sure that it won't affect anything. And if it does, go back to the drawing board, right? And then 30 days later, apply that patch. It just all depends. As far as you being a cybersecurity expert and administrator, you just need to have at least a bare minimum of patching system in place, okay? Sometimes we also want to make sure that we have good verification on our patches, right? Making sure that if we have to patch third-party apps as well, maybe we have a patch repository that we use and that we verify. Monitoring. So at a base level, right, just the term monitoring, we want to have some sort of system in place. I'm always going to talk about a SIM or SIM, S-I-E-M system like Splunk, where you can aggregate and collect all your logs to do monitoring and create dashboards. We have active versus passive monitoring, right? With active monitoring, that's going to be looking at the network in real time, right? The ability to actually respond in real time to potential events or anomalies. And then we have passive monitoring, and that's also where SIM or SIM systems can be used, where we go aggregate logs. Maybe we're getting information that's 30 minutes or an hour old on our servers and devices, and that can be what was called passive monitoring. And when we're doing our log diving or our threat hunting, we can also look at those past or previous logs to also look at anomalies, just not in real time, right? This can help us with compliance and auditing if we do monitoring correctly, we also want to think about our lifecycle management, right? How long do we want to keep old logs? If we're doing active monitoring, do we have AI and machine learning to help us detect and respond to anomalies in real time? And is it tuned well enough to not throw up a bunch of false positives and overload us, right? As administrators, we don't want to spend our whole day just looking at false positives, right? So it's a good, it's a, it's a balancing act, right? In threat detection, you want to be reactive and proactive at a timely manner, but you don't want it too sensitive, okay? So monitoring, this is something we want to do to help us secure our enterprise. All right, let's do our first check on learning. Bring this quiz up. Okay, so question one. What is the primary purpose of applying patches in the context of security? So we're going to go with C here to fix vulnerabilities, bugs, or issues in software and systems. Question two, what is the primary purpose of implementing network segmentation in an enterprise environment? We're going to go with B to isolate network resources and control access between them, enhancing security. Some of the options here I was looking at, guys, uh, have equal access, no. To encrypt data, no. C could be a potential answer, though, because like, if we want to monitor maybe a department like research and development that's using a bunch of third-party apps that could like expose ports and stuff, maybe if we segment them, it's an easier way for us to just look at that one segmented environment and do a little bit more in-depth monitoring and analysis, right? So it could make it more efficient, but it's not the primary purpose. Got to look at the wording, right? Question three, 
In the context of security, what is the primary purpose of an access control list? That's going to be C, to define rules that grant or deny traffic flow to and from network resources, from the outside to the inside network, or even, we could even do it at a micro level, right? East to west filtering. We could have host space firewalls on our host that filter between our endpoints and our actual LAN, okay? It's not always just from WAN to LAN, outside to inside, uh, things like that, right? Question four. What is the main goal of implementing the principle of least privilege in an organization's security policy? That's going to be B, to ensure that users have only the minimum levels of access or permissions needed to perform their job functions. Question five. What is the primary objective of implementing encryption in an organization's security strategy? So let's look to create a list of applications. No. To monitor network traffic. No. To grant user permissions, no, that'll be like our back. We're going to go with C to convert data into a coded form to prevent unauthorized access or data breaches, right? When we're doing like encryption on data at rest or our storage, that's exactly why we do it. Question six, why are application allow lists considered an effective mitigation technique in enterprise security? We're going to go with B again. They define which applications are permitted to run on a system blocking all others by default. All right, awesome. 